Well, good afternoon, all. Um, we're going to continue on in our spinal cord injury lecture series. Uh, today, I'm going to be uh, talking through the autonomic dysfunction that occurs after spinal cord injury. <clears throat> we have um, actually relatively new uh, guidelines. These are modified from previous versions uh, explaining uh, autonomic dysreflexia and other autonomic dysfunction. Uh, this also just came out in the topics of spinal cord injury rehabilitation as a, a manuscript um, within the last month or two. So um, I'm not, not sure how uh, much I'll update, but we'll, uh, we'll have some things to discuss as we go forward. Um, I wanna start off with a case. Uh, this is a 45 year old gentleman with C6, Asia impairment scale A, tetraplegia. Um, it, the chief complaint is hypertensive crisis. So his past medical history is notable for uh, an upper motor neuron bladder with the trusor sphincter dys dysinergia. Um, he had sphincter otomies uh, performed twice um, and unfortunately they scarred down. And so since 2005, he's had a suprapubic catheter. Um, because of the indwelling catheter, he has uh, developed recurrent uh, stones uh, in the bladder as well as the kidney. Um, he has a ureteral stent uh, that has been placed while he's awaiting lithotripsy, uh, where they hope to uh, break those stones down into, into powder. Um, usually he has neurogenic hypotension uh, with the baseline blood pressure of 98 over 57. Um, he has been on uh, Florinef and Midodrin uh, to help keep his blood pressure up uh, in that range. And he's got a previous EKG with left ventricular hypertrophy. Um, <clears throat> so he's uh, currently on oxybutynin for his bladder, baclofen for uh, spasticity as well as Valium and uh, Florinef. Uh, they've uh, taken him off of the midodrine. Um And then uh, he had previously been on dibenzaline. We'll talk about that uh, in a few minutes. Uh, that had been discontinued and he was uh, using nitropaste on a PRN basis. So the current uh, crisis is that his blood pressure is, is 170 over 120 and his heart rate is 52 beats per minute. <clears throat> so this is um, suboptimal. Uh, I want you to be thinking through this as we go forward uh, and then uh, maybe you can help me uh, solve this at the end. So just as a reminder, uh, the central nervous system is comprised of both somatic and autonomic nervous systems. Uh, that is, they are integrated uh, at the level of the cord. Um, so the um, parasympathetic nervous system uh, arises, so you have cranial nerves, and then you have uh, sacral nerves, and then you have the sympathetic nervous system, uh, which uh, basically lives and breathes, it begins in the spinal cord, uh, in the thoracolumbar regions of the cord. So we'll talk through those a little bit more. Um, after high spinal cord injury, you're likely to see sympathetic blunting. Um, and that's in addition to the somatic nervous system, uh, motor paralysis, depending upon level and completeness of the injury. So uh, just as a reminder, the autonomic nervous system uh, plays a large role in many uh, systems uh, of the body. We're gonna be spending a fair amount of time talking specifically about uh, cardiac and pulmonary uh, dysfunction, um, but recognize that there's influences uh, uh, in several organ systems uh, as well. So this communication occurs. This is the cord. This is a sympathetic chain ganglion. And I want to just remind you that you have sensory information um, coming up these afferent uh, nerves. The uh, afferent nerves have their cell body in the dorsal root ganglion. And then they synapse at the intermediate lateral horns of the cord, the thoracolumbar uh, cord, with the preganglionic sympathetic fibers. And those, uh, those are listed in um, solid red here. Uh, they subsequently go on and synapse with postganglionic uh, receptors as well. So um, as we go through this, um, I wanna talk a little bit about the neurotransmitters um, in the central nervous system and, uh, uh, and particularly the autonomic nervous system. So 
Acetylcholine, we remember, uh, is released from all preganglionic fibers within the autonomic nervous system. So um, it plays a role uh, both in the parasympathetic uh, as well as the um, um, sympathetic uh, nervous system uh, in that it's released from uh, the, the preganglionic fibers. Um, acetylcholine is also released from the postganglionic parasympathetic nerve terminals. Um, and we recognize its influence with both nicotinic cholinergic receptors as well as muscarinic cholinergic receptors. The nicotinic receptors uh, uh, lie at the autonomic ganglion, the adrenal medulla and skeletal muscle uh, at the motor end plates. The muscarinic cholinergic receptors are um, found in cardiac muscles, smooth muscle and uh, glands. Now in the adrenergic uh, system, uh, so it's called that because of adrenaline, that was the previous uh, name. We, we now um, call these uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine. These are the neurotransmitters from the uh, postganglionic uh, sympathetic nervous uh, system. The epinephrine, remember, has an R group, a methyl group here um, at the uh, N uh, terminal region. Um, and that allows epinephrine to interact with alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, and beta-2 receptors. Um, so uh, obviously it has a huge influence uh, during fight and flight uh, type of situations. Norepinephrine is uh, very similar to epinephrine except that it's missing the methyl group here that it, it has no R and hence its name, no R epinephrine. Um, so norepinephrine is released from the sympathetic postganglionic fibers and interacts with alpha-1, alpha-2, and beta-1 uh, adrenergic receptors. <clears throat> so sympathetic nervous system, again, arises from the thoracolumbar cord. Um, it conveys fight or flight. So uh, basically, these are crisis situations, um, and it activates uh, the system. Uh, multiple systems, uh, as you can see here, uh, to influence the person's ability to uh, survive the crisis. And again, just a, a bigger uh, blow up of this dorsal root ganglion has afferent uh, sensory information coming in from all, all kinds of places. It comes from um, uh, the limbs, it comes from uh, visceral organs. Um, anyway, that afferent information does synapse uh, in the intermediate lateral horn of the cord where the cell body lies. So this is actually the home of the sympathetic nervous system, the preganglionic uh, fibers uh, um, basically will go to the ganglion and uh, synapse uh, with the uh, postganglionic uh, adrenergic fibers. So, we know that also the parasympathetic nervous system, as I mentioned, uh, arises from cranial nerves and sacral nerves. Um, and its role basically is to uh, provide energy conservation. Um, so essentially what it does, uh, rest and digest is the way that we remember this. Um, after a crisis situation, the parasympathetic nervous system is responsible for basically uh, replenishing all of the substrates and whatnot that were utilized during the crisis. And so brings us back to homeostasis. Now, sympathetic parasympathetic nervous system are, are constantly in a tug of war. They are never completely shut off. Uh, well, never is a relative term. Um, generally speaking, you will always have some sympathetic or some uh, parasympathetic influences uh, in this tug of war. So if, if we look at persons with spinal cord injury who are under parasympathetic influence, the bronchial tree, but not sympathetic because they have the sympathetic blunting, these folks are gonna develop bronchial constriction and, and mucus secretions. So tight pipes with a lot of gunk in them. Um, this is something that we're gonna have to manage and I'll have a, a separate lecture just on uh, pulmonary dysfunction after spinal cord injury. Um, those of you who've worked with me for a while, however, know that as we bring folks to the rehab unit, um, I'm, I'm very much advocating for managing particularly higher levels of injury um, with around the clock nebulizer treatments, usually uh, duo nebs to help moisten the secretion in airways, um, postural percussion and drainage and or vibration uh, 
uh, within a short period after that. And then um, as soon as possible after that, using mechanical and exsufflation to clear the mucus from the airways. If you don't do this within 30 minutes of the nebulizer treatment, those secretions are just gonna dry up uh, basically and create the mucus plug that we try to uh, prevent. So again, much more information on this in an upcoming lecture. We know that the sympathetic blunting is gonna have profound influences on the heart as well as the vascular tree. Um, that uh, influence basically is also going to be um, impacted or in influenced by a relative venous stasis. So, um, particularly in the lower extremities, uh, the person's uh, paralyzed muscles no longer contracting to push blood forward through the venous system. So you have that impaired uh, muscle pump. You've got sympathetic blunting that also decreases uh, the venoconstriction of the inferior uh, vena cava, so that essentially it's in a dilated state. And then you have impaired ventilation. Again, part of the respiratory uh, lecture, we'll come back to that. Um, basically, you have less of a vacuum because you cannot um, inspire uh, as well. Uh, and this is partly because it, it's a restrictive, neurogenic restrictive lung disease. So all of those contribute to a reduced uh, preload. Remember, that's going to um, give us a lower left ventricular and diastolic volume. So the preload is going to diminish uh, by Frank Starling's mechanism. The heart won't uh, contract as robustly uh, with a diminished preload. Um, and, uh, and so stroke volume is going to be diminished. Uh, typically uh, in, a, in an intact nervous system, uh, the, the heart would speed up. Uh, so we'd have that chronotropic response to compensate for a lower stroke volume. Um, but again, because of the blunted sympathetic nervous system, uh, we aren't going to see that compensation occur. Um, and it's very rare that we see heart rates over 120 in persons with tetraplegia or high paraplegia. Um, early on, this can also contribute to dysrhythmias. Uh, so we need to keep that in mind. Um, <clears throat> and then circulatory hypokinesis is a term that we talk about with regard to exercise uh, blood pressure. So if you or I were to do arm crank ergometry and we increase the workload, every time we increase the workload, both our heart rate and our blood pressure would go up. Um, but a person with spinal cord injury has reduced vasoconstriction, their afterload is gonna be diminished. Um, they have a reduced venoconstriction, so the preload is diminished. Um, and this impaired venous pump that we talked about before all of this means that you're gonna have less blood returning to the heart during exercise. And so it's um, likely, per particularly uh, with tetraplegia, that as, as a person with spinal cord injury is doing arm crank ergometry, uh, their blood pressure will actually drop. Uh, and so uh, we try to counter that by using um, compressing garments. We'll talk about that in a moment, um, as well as an abdominal binder. <clears throat> so, this neurogenic orthostatic hypotension uh, occurs at rest. Um, so a, uh, a systolic blood pressure um, that is under 90 uh, without improvement, um, while supine that gets worse as the person sits um, is uh, considered neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. Um, and again, this is primarily because of the sympathetic blunting. So management strategies in the first week or two of rehabilitation, we're just trying to get people to sit up without passing out. Um, and that's hard for you and I to, to even imagine, but um, our therapists will use a reclining wheelchair and or tilt table to try to improve the person's tolerance to these lower uh, blood pressures. We will provide abdominal binder to um, pull the abdominal contents in against the inferior vena cava, trying to essentially squeeze it. Uh, <clears throat> and then we'll use compression stockings. TED hose, thromboembolic deterrent hose, um, don't provide uh, sufficient compression to uh, actually help with the, uh, blood return from the lower extremities. So usually uh, we require uh, at least a medium gauge compression stocking. Um, and I, I try to get those thigh high when possible. Um, pharmacological interventions can include initially salt tablets <clears throat> and then 
oftentimes we will move forward to fluorin F or midodrin um, and then uh, titrate that to effect. So uh, recent a great manuscript out by uh, Eschelbach's group um, talks about managing neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. So autonomic dysreflexia, we mentioned early on, I'm gonna uh, take a couple of slides and go through this now. Uh, this was first described back in 1890 by Anthony Bowlby um, and his uh, description at the time, a massive sympathetic outflow in response to a noxious stimuli below the level of the spinal cord injury in, and the original definition, in complete spinal cord injury lesions above T6. We now know that there are some folks, uh, T7 and T8, uh, who can still get autonomic dysreflexia. Um, and we also know that persons with incomplete spinal cord injury can also get autonomic dysreflexia. What are the complications? Stroke, seizures, organ failure, and death, all of which are, yes, suboptimal. Um, why is T6 uh, so important? Um, mostly because the greater splanchnic nerve comes off at T7 and T8 uh, primarily. Um, and so the greater splanchnic nerve provides innervation to the splanchnic vascular bed uh, and uh, sympathetic stimulation is gonna cause vasoconstriction of that splanchnic bed. Um, and basically if you have control over your splanchnic bed, um, autonomic control, uh, then you're not gonna be as high risk for this hypertensive crisis we'll describe in a few minutes. Um, we also know that the adrenal medulla, uh, the nerves to the adrenal medulla come from T7 and T8 as well. And so you've got a double whammy there. If your injury is above, uh, is at or above T6, basically you won't be able to control reflex activation of the uh, splanchnic vasculature or the uh, adrenal medulla. So <clears throat> that said, um, we've got a number of uh, nicknames for autonomic dysreflexia that have been used over the years, uh, initially called autonomic hyperreflexia, but also it's been called mass reflex, paroxysmal hypertension, sympathetic hyperreflexia, I like this one, paroxysmal neurogenic hypertension, um, and then autonomic spasticity. So if you're gonna do a, uh, a manuscript looking at autonomic dysreflexia, you wanna include these pseudonyms uh, so that you don't miss manuscripts that may have been describing autonomic dysreflexia uh, under a different term. We know that um, generally uh, somewhere around 50 to 85% of people with injuries at T6 and above will have autonomic dysreflexia. Um, there have been case reports of folks uh, with autonomic dysreflexia, uh, even at levels of T7 and T8 spinal cord injury. And as I mentioned before, these can be complete or incomplete spinal cord injury lesions. Uh, it depends on um, how much of the sympathetic nervous system was disrupted uh, because of the spinal cord injury. So early on after spinal cord injury, we, we have this period of, of relative spinal shock. Um, so uh, usually it um, will resolve uh, within two months or so um, as sacral reflexes begin to return. Um, we realize that we're likely to have autonomic dysreflexia. So in this initial period, it's unlikely that the person will have AD, uh, but when they do first have it, hopefully they're still in the hospital and we can help them through it uh, and help describe. We try to describe it to them, we try to educate them, um, but if they've not had autonomic dysreflexia before they leave the rehab hospital, um, we need to be following up with them fairly frequently uh, because it's likely to occur. Um, Linden reported out 92% uh, had their first episode within one year. Uh, there are some folks who um, have had it uh, subsequent to that, but it's not clear that, uh, that their lesion was the same. So in some of those cases, um, there appeared to have been a syrinx that put them uh, potentially at higher risk for AD. So um, how, how does it occur? Why does it occur? Um, you know, initially it's, it's not unlike spasticity in that there is uh, a thought to be um, basically a blockage of the inhibitory tracts uh, to the sympathetic nervous system. Uh, Tizel reported out in 2000 um, that peripheral or central 
receptors will increase their sensitivity. So these adrenergic receptors. Um, and, uh, and then there's the question about increased synaptic levels of neurotransmitters when they, uh, when they are turned on. So all of those may be contributing, um, but the bottom line, a noxious stimuli below the level of the injury. We typically uh, um, see our first episode of autonomic dysreflexia related to a distended bladder. Um, and so um, what is happening there is you have afferent information ascending the cord, but it's blocked at the level of the spinal cord injury with a reflex uh, sympathetic outflow causing splanchnic vasoconstriction and subsequently hypertension. That increased pressure is sensed by baroreceptors that send information to the medulla um, and it sends information back to the heart to slow it down uh, with a relative rate of cardia. But below the level of the injury, the person remains vasoconstricted. Above the level of the injury, we see uh, flushing, sweating, and a pounding headache, all of this associated with autonomic dysreflexia. So um, how do we define this? An increase in uh, baseline systolic blood pressure of greater than 20 millimeters of mercury for adults or greater than 15 millimeters of mercury uh, for children. Um, it's typically associated with bradycardia, um, but in the initial episode, you may see a relative tachycardia in response to the, the, the sympathetic um, hormones. Um, you may also see additional cardiac rhythm disturbances as you have the relative rate of cardio, you potentially could lead into uh, a, a partial uh, heart block, for example. Um, the headache that comes on typically is bilateral uh, in the frontal and occipital regions. Um, it's felt to be due to uh, uh, a lack of sympathetic tone and dilation of these pain sensitive cranial arteries. It's probably not due to the high blood pressure itself, but due to the pain sensitive uh, cranial arteries being uh, dilated. So um, other uh, signs and symptoms of autonomic dysreflexia can include, we mentioned the sweating and flushing above the level of the injury. And in fact, there's a very clear demarcation when you see this uh, with somebody who has a thoracic, uh, high thoracic spinal cord injury, for example, you can see the spot on their chest uh, that is associated with their spinal cord injury. Um, and it may be at T4, for example, below that is relative uh, power, whereas above that, uh, the flushing and sweating occur. They may also have nasal congestion, uh, again, because of the um, higher uh, blood pressure and the uh, relative uh, activation or dilation. Um, and then we may see piloerection on the back of the neck and, and on the arms. Horner syndrome, uh, remember, um, ptosis, meiosis, and hydrosis, and enophthalmus, all associated with this. And then they may also develop uh, priapism, uh, all in response to a noxious stimuli below the level of the injury. Significant morbidity and mortality associated with this uh, can include retinal hemorrhages, intracerebral hemorrhages, subarachnoid hemorrhages, myocardial infarction, seizures, um, organ failure, and yes, death. Um, so the number one cause of autonomic dysreflexia in a person with spinal cord injury is uh, urological. It's related to the bladder, which is oh, number one as we talk about elimination. Um, so bladder distension, bladder calculi, renal calculi, but not trigger geometry, uh, can contribute to uh, autonomic dysreflexia. Urinary tract infections, bladder spasms, trauma, and cancer. Uh, remember that these folks are relatively insensate, and so they won't feel uh, where this is coming from. In, instead, this noxious stimuli will simply uh, drive them into a hypertensive crisis. And so these are first things that we look for. Um, the number two cause of autonomic dysreflexia is number two. Uh, that is bowel-related. Uh, so a distended bowel, an ileus, constipation and or diarrhea, acute abdomen, um, or even an ugly one, as I say, um, can cause autonomic dysreflexia, hernia, trauma, and again, cancer. All of these potential causes um, as a noxious stimuli below the level of the injury that stimulates this reflex sympathetic outflow. Skin lesions can cause autonomic dysreflexia. 
And as the largest organ system, uh, the skin is at high, high risk. Um, so it's probably the, the number three cause. Um, those with pressure injuries, uh, lacerations or burns, um, infections, including ingrown toenails can cause uh, autonomic dysreflexia, um, hypertensive crisis, stroke out and die, and ingrown toenail, yes, can do that. Uh, and then skin cancers below the level of the injury can also cause autonomic dysreflexia. Fractures, um, uh, you and I typically would think, oh, of course you would recognize this, but remember that our, our, our folks with spinal cord injury are relatively insensate, they may not know. I've had a person come into my clinic um, with a spiral fracture and his foot turned around in the opposite direction. And he didn't realize it except that he was having autonomic dysreflexia. Dislocations, sprains and strains, heterotopic ossification, uh, infections and tumors. All of these things can be a noxious stimuli below the level of the injury and may be causing autonomic dysreflexia. Um, there are genital uh, causes. So for men, prostatitis, infection and cancers, can cause autonomic dysreflexia. Testicular torsion uh, can cause it. And so it's important um, if you have scrotal uh, compression at all uh, to try to relieve that uh, uh, pressure. That, that is a common cause, again, of autonomic dysreflexia. Uh, an erection and priapism uh, and even ejaculation, all of these can actually cause autonomic dysreflexia uh, in men. For women as well, Pelvic inflammatory disease can be painful. Endometriosis, urinary tract infections, cancer uh, in the genital uh, regions. Orgasm can cause autonomic dysreflexia for women. And then certainly um, the women out there would recognize typically uh, pregnancy, labor, and delivery can be a painful process. Um, our folks with spinal cord injury don't necessarily have the pain, but they could have and often will have autonomic dysreflexia. And so that increased blood pressure um, may, may cause an obstetrician to think about something like preeclampsia, but we want them also thinking about autonomic dysreflexia. Also recognize that nursing for women whose injury is above the level of the nipple, um, nursing can be a noxious stimuli below the level of the injury and cause autonomic dysreflexia. Um, these cardiovascular causes. So, um, you know, angina, uh, typically you or I would experience that and it may be radiating pain to our left arm. The, the person with the spinal cord injury may not have that sensory uh, information. Um, and in fact, their first clue that they're having a heart attack might be autonomic dysreflexia. And that's, that's a difficult situation because then you have a failing heart, an ischemic heart, that is driving the blood pressure up and makes it, its work even harder. So um, that's something that we need to make sure that we have a baseline EKG for um, because uh, we would wanna know relatively quickly if the person is having an acute MI. Pericarditis, pulmonary embolus, DVTs, um, and then vascular claudication for those folks who have incomplete spinal cord injuries. So for example, central cord syndrome uh, with a cervical incomplete injury, uh, Vascular claudication can contribute. That's a noxious stimuli below the level of the injury. So how do we manage it acutely? Um, elevate the head, loosen tight clothing, leg bags, uh, et cetera. Check bladder first and then bowel and then look for other sources. Monitor vitals uh, approximately every one to two minutes um, as well as symptoms during this time. Um, and then consider pharmacological intervention if you can't find a source or if you found a source that you can't immediately correct. Um, so uh, in the uh, acute situation, uh, so let's say the person has a kinked Foley catheter, for example, uh, but we didn't know that right away. We could start with nitro paste uh, topically and um, you use different, uh, different amounts of this depending upon how high the blood pressure is. We'll talk about that in, in just a few minutes in our quick set orders. Uh, also consider using other uh, medications. Um, now, if you have a situation like our, our gentleman in the case report, um, uh, in his situation, he had uh, 
renal stones and ureteral stones, uh, and he was awaiting lithotripsy. Um, so we had had him on dibenzaline, uh, and uh, and unfortunately um, he had run out of the medication. Didn't let us uh, know that. Um, so sub subsequently uh, he had not come into the hospital on dibenzaline. Um, and these other things could be used. When, when would you use this? For example, uh, you know that somebody's got a fracture and it's not gonna heal in 30, or 30 minutes or an hour. Uh, it's gonna take weeks. Um, that's the kind of scenario where I would use these. Now, dibenzaline recently has really uh, skyrocketed in terms of its cost. And so more, um, more recently, I've been using terazosin or prazosin uh, just to try to keep blood pressure under control um, during this time of healing, whether it's uh, a pressure injury that's healing, a fracture that's healing, um, even an overdistended bladder, uh, it, it is a, uh, a muscle. And so having a pulled muscle, those of you who've ever had that experience can be painful for some time. Um, a distended bladder, overdistended bladder can also contribute to that same kind of pain. And so the person may need to be on a, uh, a chronic dose uh, for the short term. So these quick set orders, uh, typically I, I like the residents to include these. Um, if the blood pressure is greater than 120 over 80, which um, seems a little crazy because for most of us, uh, that would be a relatively normal blood pressure, um, or it's 20 uh, millimeters of mercury above baseline. So first check the Foley, check the bowel, loosen the restrictive clothing, and then consider using the nitroglycerin 2% ointment. Um, one inch for blood pressure uh, greater than 140 over 90, two inches for blood pressure greater than 170 over 90. Keep looking for the source of autonomic dysreflexia. If you find the source, be ready to wipe off the nitro paste, um, or you could cause a rebound um, hypotension uh, associated with that. So. Keep that in mind. I know that uh, Steve Kirschbloom at Kessler uh, talks about if you're going to put uh, nitro paste on, put it on the person's forehead. It's not the placement of it so much as he just wants to remind people to wipe it off once you're done with the episode. Um, it is just as effective if you put it on the chest, but uh, sometimes uh, people forget that it's been on there and then suddenly the person is no longer in hypertensive crisis, but a hypotensive crisis. Um, and then these are the orders for nursing. If this is unresolved, then uh, nursing should contact the physician, uh, PA or uh, uh, nurse practitioner. So um, why is this important? Um, we know that basically our folks have a diminished cardiac reserve. Um, and uh, we also know that even in able-bodied adults, so if you look at the New England Journal of Medicine, um, uh, way back in 2001, they talked about the relative morbidities associated with uh, a, an acute hypertensive crisis. Uh, this is for able-bodied individuals. And, and at the time, they didn't even think about, uh, you know, the, the issues of uh, spinal cord injury and autonomic dysreflexia. But this hypertensive crisis in persons with spinal cord injury warrants a very aggressive um, uh, intervention to get the blood pressure back down to baseline. Um, and again, that may require nitro, nitroprusside, pentolamine, hydralazine. Um, usually I, I try to avoid the beta blockers in this acute uh, situation because of the relative um, bradycardia that can occur with uh, high levels of autonomic dysref dysreflexia. Um, recognize that um, this also warrants ICU transfer if we can't get this under control relatively quickly. Um, we want to prevent target organ dysfunction. Um, and so, uh, <clears throat> so let's come back to our case. Um, unfortunately, our, our patient was found unresponsive and without a pulse just a few minutes later. Uh, they called a uh, cardiac code um, and the person was found to be in pulseless electrical activity. Um, he underwent 30 minutes of resuscitation and was subsequently intubated. Uh, uh, he had advanced directives, but uh, for some reason, those weren't noted uh, as they went through there and they transferred him to the ICU now with an anoxic encephalopathy. Um, subsequently, the family came forward and said, you know, these were not his wishes. 
Uh, once confirmed, they discontinued the ventilator and he passed away about 20 minutes later. Um, pathology um, on the autopsy showed acute and chronic interstitial nephritis that went along with the um, stones that we were talking about. He had bilateral pulmonary congestion uh, because of this, um, this backup uh, essentially uh, with the high, high afterload. Um, he had developed bilateral pleural effusions and then a pericardial uh, infusion, but he only had minimal coronary artery disease. And so that's the other thing. Oftentimes these folks will, will um, die and the, um, the coroner's report will indicate that this was a cardiac cause as opposed to autonomic dysreflexia, a little bit different. Um, but uh, uh, we need to, so when you go to try to do a retrospective cart, uh, chart review, uh, sometimes you'll be missing uh, cases that were just listed as cardiac uh, failure, um, when in fact it was autonomic dysreflexia that contributed to that. Now, in sport, uh, we need to be very aware that our folks with spinal cord injury above T6 uh, will boost. Uh, so boosting was described by Wheeler uh, back in 1994 as the intentional provocation of autonomic dysreflexia. And it occurs um, in his report, uh, basically in more than 80% of competitive athletes with spinal cord injury above T6. Um, they've been demonstrated to increase catecholamine, so your epinephrine and norepinephrine levels um, uh, by 220% uh, um, at rest or post-exercise up to 300%. Um, now recognize that folks are offsetting the circulatory hypokinesis that goes along with their spinal cord injury. And so I would much rather they used compression garments and an abdominal binder um, and, uh, and yet uh, athletes are athletes and they're all looking for a way to um, have a better performance. This is unfortunately uh, a very dangerous method uh, to be employed. And it's hard to tell if, if uh, for example, in Miami, um, you have a person, let's say that they're uh, uh, doing a 10K, uh, a, a person with spinal cord injury. Um, they show up, you show up, um, and, uh, you know, they're a little flushed, they're a little sweaty. Well, wait a minute, is that autonomic dysreflexia or is that because of thermal dysregulation, uh, which we're going to talk about as well. So um, you have to have a high index of suspicion for these folks. So the thermal regulatory responses. Um, a person with high spinal cord injury uh, will become essentially poikilothermic, uh, meaning that they will take on the ambient temperature around them. Um, and so, for example, um, I remember uh, in, uh, in Michigan, two episodes on different ends of the spectrum. One episode, a gentleman with a C6 spinal cord injury um, was out at a softball tournament watching the game. He was sitting uh, under a tree in the shade. It was 90 degrees um, <clears throat> and subsequently passed out. And folks were concerned about heat stroke. Um, well, come to find out there was a little bit of a breeze going by um, and he actually took on the ambient temperature around him. His body temperature dropped to 90 degrees, actually dropped to about 90 uh, four degrees, <clears throat> and um, he was actually having hypothermia. Um, another uh, situation, um, I, I've told some folks about this before, had a person from the UP, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, uh, come down to my clinic in January or February, and apparently their van uh, lost its heat on the way down. Um, and so he showed up at the clinic and well, hello, Dr. Gator. I was speaking very, very slowly, just looked a little off and, and immediately asked him to get vitals um, because I was, I was worried that he might be having a stroke. Well, in fact, he was hypothermic. Uh, and in about 30, 45 minutes, he did warm up to me. Uh, patients do that occasionally and um, began speaking again in his usual uh, measured tone. <clears throat> so, uh, we realize that our folks with spinal cord injury do have a, a reduced plasma volume um, and they can't sweat uh, below the level of their injury, uh, many of them. And so they may sweat profusely above the level of the injury, but uh, usually that's not enough to um, uh, 
to be able to compensate. And particularly if you're in a humid environment, uh, <clears throat> then the, the sweat doesn't evaporate uh, to cool the skin off. And so those folks can very, very quickly go into hypothermia. Um, <clears throat> We uh, have at our, um, in our toolbox uh, the ability to document autonomic function, uh, but frankly, we've not been doing a great job of that uh, here. And um, I, I'm going to be working with Dr. Beavis uh, specifically on a project um, looking at uh, autonomic function after spinal cord injury. Uh, we will be scoring these. Uh, not unlike the way that we score the uh, dermatomes or the manual muscle test, um, we've got a scoring system of two for normal function, one for reduced or altered um, autonomic function. Zero is a complete loss of control and then not tested. And we're supposed to be scoring each of these boxes as we come through here. Um, so essentially uh, that's going to give us um, the whole realm of potential autonomic dysfunction associated with control of the heart, blood pressure, sweating, temperature, um, the bronchopulmonary system, the urinary tract, bowel, and sexual function. So um, we will be uh, monitoring those to a greater extent, uh, both inpatient and outpatient uh, moving forward. Um, and we have a number of opportunities uh, to do uh, cardiovascular in particular uh, research, but also uh, pulmonary research, bowel bladder research uh, with regard to autonomic uh, dysfunction. Um, recognize that we can be looking at heart rate responses and blood pressure responses. Uh, we have a number of different things that we can do to assess um, with exercise. Um, and, um, and then obviously some of this may be contributing to uh, metabolic syndrome that has a whole nother set of issues associated with it. So um, I uh, purposely uh, moved through that relatively quickly uh, so that there might be time for some uh, questions or thoughts. Um, feel free to, to chime in now. Um, I have my uh, references here uh, listed. Uh, and for those of you who are interested, uh, if you want to shoot me an email, I would be happy to uh, send you a PDF version of these slides. Uh, so moving forward, um, <clears throat> hopefully you would have them at your uh, fingertips. Any questions, thoughts, concerns? Okay, um, I'm gonna stop my screen share. I'm, I'm, I'm a little surprised that there are no questions. This is, uh, this is crazy um, physiology. Um, and um, it's, it's the type of thing that really caught my attention. This is one of the reasons I was so excited to uh, work with the spinal cord injury population. The physiology is just uh, absolutely amazing. So um, I guess with no questions, I'll go ahead and leave you all. You've got an extra five minutes or so uh, to your day. Um, do reach out uh, if you would like a copy of the slides or if you're just shy and have additional questions that you don't want to uh, address right now. Otherwise, have a great day. Keep your blood pressure under control. <laughs>